Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Mikkel Thorpe, and this is the Expat Money Show. Today's guest is a pro voice talent originally from Detroit who lives in San Miguel de Allende in Mexico for the last nine years. He was born into an apocalyptic religious cult and didn't awaken until the age of 38, which opened him up to much broader ideas that the government and establishment that supports it are not whatsoever acting in the best interest of its citizens. Today, in addition to recording voiceover clients for, uh, internationally, he loves venturing deep into the Mexican countryside to find amazing artisanal mezcal. Please welcome to the show, Jonathan Lockwood. Jonathan, how are you? I'm great, Mikel. How are you? Very, very good. I am excited to have you here. Maybe start by kind of giving us a bit about your backstory. How did you end up in Mexico? How did you get into your work? I want to hear it all. Sure. Well, I'm not sure how to get into that without talking about the cult situation, see, because, uh, you know, I was born into the third generation of a, the, a Jehovah's Witness family, and my family was quite zealous about it. And, uh, you know, I was 38, like you read, uh, when I finally woke up, and that was something that just opened me up to the idea that things are not always what they seem. And, uh, I left the organization shortly after and lost my whole family as a result of that. Um, so my parents, who are in their 90s, are still alive, but have not seen or spoken to me in many years. Um, this whole thing has, again, opened me up to many other ways that we realize things are not as they seem. And so it would take me a few years after that before I started realizing, for instance, as you read again in my bio that, uh, you know, the government is not really what it seems to be. And I also had to address the concept of being a people pleaser, just going along, along with the group or the tribe and realizing there comes a time when a person has to stand up. When I realized that the United States, in my opinion, was headed toward a fiscal nightmare, I started thinking it might make sense for me to find another spot on the globe. And so I started looking at the options. So... It is interesting that over the last three years, I think we have seen a massive amount of divisiveness in families. You know, what happened with you and your family was was considerably earlier than that. But I think a lot of families will be able to relate to that right now because we see this divisiveness, whether that be left, right or woke and conservatives or different types of groups right now where, you know, maybe ideologies were not discussed at the dinner table. Now everything became front and center. And it's like, wow, you believe that? That is, for me, crazy, you know? And so have you seen a lot of these types of things or do you see any kind of uh, similarities from what you went through at a much earlier stage? Absolutely. You know, when people talk to me about my experience in that organization, which is, you know, for lack of a better term, I use the word cult. It's basically an authoritarian organization that tells people how to think and what to do and how to act in almost every important area of life. So uh, one of the things that I say is it's the best and most important thing that has ever happened to me. I don't mean waking up. Yeah, I'm glad I woke up. What I mean is I'm really grateful to have gone through that jacked up experience, to have lived through it really fully, to have believed it and embraced it really fully. Then to realize I was just wrong. I was unbelievably wrong and start picking up the pieces and putting together another life after that. But I feel in, in line with your question here that, yes, um, I feel like I had a jump start on the stuff that we've been seeing for several years now, you know. And so I used to try to say in a letter I wrote to my mother many years ago, you know, I, I give people all due credit for whatever their personal opinions are, but it seems rather ridiculous that we should punish each other because of what we do or do not believe is true. You know, why is it that we can't just get along? Why is it that we can't tolerate another person's opinion? Well, the other point is that, you know, the, the full faith that you would have had in your religion growing up is a very similar to, I think, a lot of the full faith that people have in the U.S. government, the Canadian government, society as a whole. And when you start to kind of look behind or look underneath and see all of these things and what the levers are and what the motivation is for a lot of the people that are in charge, sure. you know, it's not that they have their best interests at heart. They might have this altruistic type of facade or or sales letter or copy, you know, on the front. But what actually is the truth is, is often very far from that. 
Right. I mean, we've been hearing this for years. Well, I've been hearing it for years. You know, I worked in radio for many years and I can recall, I guess I was in my 20s when one of the radio groups I worked at in Flint, Michigan, took on a station that was News Talk. And so it was at that time as a Jehovah's Witness, I, uh, you know, you're not supposed to have any opinions about these things. And I didn't really, I didn't really even understand what the various camps believed, what they claimed to believe and what the others were accusing them of believing. Um, but I was listening to the, these uh, mostly conservative talk radio shows, and they would occasionally have someone on like I am today, <laughs> you know, uh, talking about things are not always as they seem. It could be that there are things going on behind us. People are trying to stir up animosity. And it seems to me that the conservative hosts had some toleration for these people as opposed to some of the left-leaning folks. They would entertain it. They would be generally sort of respectful. But in the end, they would say, you know, these people are a little nutty. We really, uh, you know, can't place a lot of stock in what they say. And I guess at that time, what I just concluded is I can't know. I shouldn't be paying attention to this stuff anyway in accord with my faith. You know, so I just kind of let it all go. But absolutely right. I think that that's one of the beautiful things that's happened in the last three years is that a significantly larger share of the populace now has some inkling that something else is going on here, that it is in the best interests of people to turn individuals away from one another, to create divisions. You know, the, the term uh, divide and conquer, it, I don't know what percentage, I'm from the U.S., so I, I don't know what percentage of the U.S. population really understands what that means, Maybe it's 30, 50 percent, maybe more. I don't know. But in any case, it would appear that they're not able to see when it's happening to them. Sure. That's sure. my opinion anyway. And so uh, I, I welcome the new people who are beginning to consider these things. Yeah. One of the biggest messages that we have on, on this program and in, in my work in general is really about community. You know, we are trying to to help people and bring them in. You know, if you look at a lot of other people in this industry, they'll point fingers at you and say, you know, how did you not realize this earlier? Or you're stupid for still doing this, where you're still doing these things, then you're bad, wrong and evil. And actually, that's the opposite message of what I'm trying to do. Mine is, Hey, if you didn't know before and now you do know, you know, forgive yourself because, right. you know, we all make mistakes and we do the best we can with the information right. we have at hand at that time. You know, it's it, it happens in, in every aspect. And as someone is awakening or, or, or becoming more aware of how the world actually works and, you know, peeling back the curtain, um, you know, you can't you can't punish yourself. You can't pan punish your family members or your friends or anything like that. Everybody is on their own journey through these types of things. And it's not for me or you or literally anyone else out there to shame or make someone feel bad about it. You try to support them and help them and be there for them when they want to talk about things. But it should never be a, a instance where you, you pile on or make them feel worse about it. Right. I agree. And that there is some parallel to that with my cult experience. I remember coming to the conclusion, I used to say, I don't see the point in condemning a person who will figure out in two weeks what I figured out two weeks ago, just to boil it down, you know? For sure, for sure. And then imagine someone that was two weeks ahead of you or a couple of months ahead of you now right. pointing their finger or waving their finger in your face because you didn't get it at the same time they got it. That doesn't really do us anybody any good you know i think that as a whole you know after 23 years of traveling what i have seen is that people are inherently good we are more or less the same in 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 our in our capacity for love and compassion and warmth there is a very small small minuscule minority of people who have seized control who are not like us these are sociopaths and you know but that's not the general public you know, no. with this divisiveness, they want to to make it seem like the other side of the aisle, all of them are evil. You know, I think that that's just not a realistic view as well. And I have actually seen a lot of, you know, hardcore Democrats now looking at this and going, hey, this is why we were on the left and this is what we supported. Right. But actually, there's a whole bunch of stuff in here that is getting 
piled on and, and, and we don't agree with this part. So we might not be over here, but we're, we're something else, you know? So that's why I always kind of think of libertarianism, you know, small letter L, not large, cap, not capital L, but, you know, is the best from the left and the best from the right. It's really, you know, right. all about freedom, social freedoms and economic freedoms. I think that that's what mm -hmm. we need to be looking at. Sounds good to me, Miguel. So let's get into kind of why Mexico. The world is a big, mm -hmm. big place. Nine years ago, you realized that something was not quite as it seemed. You needed a fresh start. Why Mexico? You know, it's funny. I wrote a uh, an essay in, I think it must have been at the end of 2012. So we're talking about, you know, a little over a dozen, uh, 11 years ago, I guess. And it was pretty short and sweet. I didn't want it to be ugly. You know, it really was just... I don't see how I have anything in common with most people in the country of my birth. That doesn't mean I have to move, but I thought it also doesn't mean that I have to stay either. There's nothing really philosophically connecting me to it. That combined with the fact that at that point, I really believed that the United States was headed toward a, a financial calamity, you know, mm -hmm. which I still think that. Um, that's you know, I, I just, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I just started looking at all of the options and I began just Googling around online. I began looking at uh, central Chile. There was some things going on there at that time in 2013 that looked absolutely great. How glad am I that I didn't choose Chile because it just turned out to be a nightmare in the last several years. Um, I also looked at San Miguel de Allende, Mexico. And the third on my list was, uh, was uh, New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, what Once I was again. looking at, <laughs> thank God you. Didn't oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, absolutely. So um, I was I went to central Chile for about three weeks, enjoyed it a good deal. It's very mm -hmm. nice. I came to San Miguel de Allende about six months later in 2013. Really loved this place. I have a daughter. I mean, my daughter now is 35 years old. She lives in L.A. And mm -hmm. It struck me, boy, it'd be a hell of a lot easier for me getting back to her in L.A. from central Mexico as opposed to, you know, South America or New Zealand. So I never even made it to New Zealand. I just decided I would make my home here. OK, amazing to kind of circle back on our other point about forgiving ourselves. You know what I think is very interesting, because a lot of people are leaving Canada and the U.S. and picking somewhere to go. And maybe that place is amazing and maybe that place will respect freedom and maybe things will change in the future. It's still that same type of forgiveness type of message that I, I really believe in because, you know, a lot of people did move down to Chile. A lot of people have moved to um, to different countries in Latin America or into Europe. You know, like look at what we've seen in Europe over the last few years who have just turned total totalitarian. And it's like they made a decision to move there because they thought they were getting into a better situation. They're actually in a worse situation. You know what? You did the best you can. It's OK. You can move again. You're not a vegetable. Right. You're not planted in the right. ground. You know, you can you can pick up and lose uh, leave and go to another type of country. So absolutely. You know, and I said that in that essay I wrote, I was sensitive to the idea that people were going to say to me, oh, so you think Mexico is just this wonderful, free, you know, uh, you know, wonderland or something. No, Um I looked at this as the common sense act of moving to higher ground in the event of a flood. Mm -hmm. And I was aware even at that time that maybe this won't be the place for me. Maybe I'll have to move somewhere else in the future. But I did the best I could with the information that I had at the time. And from where I stand now, I'm quite happy with my decision. Amazing. Yeah, I have seen, especially this year, I have probably... I want to say four or five clients who left Canada and the U S went down to Costa Rica, thought Costa Rica was going to be it after a month, two months, three months. They're like, this is not what I expected have now are now working one-on-one -on -one with me. And we're relocating them to a country which actually ticks the boxes, you know, of what they're looking for. So don't worry if you guys didn't get this right the first time, but, um, but to, to go back to Mexico, I think that Mexico does have, a lot going for it. You know, we just released a book uh, for my company, Expat's Guide on Moving to Mexico. And it's a country that I've had an experience with on and off for the last 20 some odd years. And it definitely holds a very special place in my heart. Maybe you can talk to me a little bit about the things that you really like about Mexico. Like, why does Mexico keep sure. you now? Well, you know, one of the things that uh, 
I so what I was basically doing is I was looking for a place where I thought I would be somewhat more free. And I remember reading something by a local guy here in San Miguel, Jim Carger. He was saying, you know, the, the next best thing perhaps to an actually free country is one where things are so government is so inefficient that you can pretty much do most of what you want to do without them uh, caring or seeming to care or doing anything about it. That has been the beauty of it. What's interesting is when something happens that uh, goes against that theme. And for instance, here just a few months ago, Mexico enacted perhaps the strictest anti-smoking law in the world. Uh, everybody's just shocked. You know, why Mexico? You know, of course, the good news is that you can always find ways around these things, too. They are exacting pretty serious fines on business owners, you know, who have these rooftop terraza bars, and they're really upset about this. Um, but already we're beginning to see certain states here in Mexico find ways around it. And uh, I'm sure it won't. It's just a matter of time before, uh, you know, this is somehow moderated, in my opinion. Um, so freedom for me, it had to do with uh, weather also, honestly. Um, I, I had been living in Phoenix for eight years pr prior to coming here. So humidity is something that I really hated a lot, did not like the humidity. And that was so it was pretty much the same with central Chile and here in central Mexico. Uh, what's funny is people tend to think when I say Mexico, I will tell them I live in the high desert mountains of central Mexico. And they'll say, oh, by the beach then? That has happened so many times. People just, Americans in general, just think of Mexico as being this resort beach town. No, sure, sure. we live in the middle. Um, lovely weather. We do have a winter Typically, still temperatures, high temperatures in Fahrenheit, if you'll forgive me, are are still in the 70s, you know, but they will get down into the 40s and even the 30s from time wow. to time, nighttime lows. But, you know, eight, eight and a half months, it's just gorgeous. And we've already entered into that some time ago now. I like that. Um, I knew a little bit of Spanish. I was more comfortable with Spanish than, you know, learning some new Asian language or something like that. And uh, so, again, proximity to my daughter in L.A., you know, this was the right place for me. Yeah, absolutely. You know, well, to, to quickly touch on the Spanish piece of things, it's work. I mean, to live down here in I, I'm in Panama City, you know, you need to put it in effort. You need to put the time and energy and effort into to learning the second language. But it's doable. You can sure. actually do it like anybody can do it, especially if you're coming as a native English speaker to learn Spanish, even just, you know, in a little bit really takes you a far ways. You know, I've traveled to Japan, I don't know, 10, 15 times, Thailand, 10, 15 times. I used to live in Singapore and went all over Malaysia and Indonesia and Philippines and all of these types of places. My wife's from mainland China to learn some of the languages over there is is more than a little bit of effort i mean right. this is right. a, a lifelong accomplishment if you can learn yeah. you know within a one or two years down here in panama i became pretty decent you know like i would consider myself conversationally fluent right now mm -hmm. all right if i'm going to be going to the doctors in its medical terms or there's you know i'm some financial stuff that maybe some really detailed things, maybe I won't get that. But for everyday living, learning Spanish is a completely, um, you can accomplish this, I guess is what I'm trying to, yes. to come around to. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, my Spanish was quite poor. It's still not that great. But as I tell people all the time, my restaurant Spanish is fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things about San Miguel de Allende too, I guess, you know, you're talking to me here. Those of you who, who've investigated it probably found out we're always told it probably has the highest percentage of expats, that is to say non-Mexicans living here. I would say probably 50 to 60% of them are from the US, maybe another 20% are from Canada and another 20% are from Europe. And you know, there are some people from Asia who live here too. Um, the thing is most of the people here speak either a fair amount or are extremely conversant in English. And so, you know, I was doing my Pimsleur like crazy before I got here. I had my rental house. The taxi was coming up and I'm like, okay, all right, all right, I'm going to get in. Okay. Buenas tardes, joven. <laughs> Sabes donde esta? Where do you want to go? 
they'd say. <laughs> you know, and this happens all the time. And you're like, what? So it yeah. makes you a bit more lazy probably than most places in Latin America because so many people speak English. In fact, you can start talking to them in Spanish and invariably they go, no, I want to get better at English. And they're talking yeah. to you in English. You know, it makes you a little lazy. Furthermore, I, I married a Mexicana. So she kind of gets in between me and any important Spanish speaking. It seems like I generally do, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, do you speak Spanish or English with your wife? English. English. Okay. You know, and, and there is a mix. Always there's a mix. We have a little girl too. She's six years old. Amazing. And uh, yeah, Romina, and she definitely, she understands virtually everything I say. It's one of those things where I, I've spoken to another young woman who told me, she went through the same thing. And she said, she's not going to be aware that she is speaking two languages. She's just going to know these words when she grows up. And she understands everything I say. You know, she'll say to me that she wants to eat, you know, comer or something like that. And then she'll look at me and she'll go, eat. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, yeah, it, it's mostly English in this house. When I'm involved in the language, you know, her uh, older daughter, who is actually the biological daughter or, or mother of, of our daughter that we've adopted, um, you know, they speak Spanish all the time. Romina mainly speaks Spanish, but mm -hmm. mostly with me, we speak English. Okay. I have a six-year-old little girl as well, yeah. and our house is a combination of English, Spanish, and Chinese at all times. <laughs> and my daughter just switches between all of us. You know, with mommy, it's Chinese. With daddy, it's English. With the niñeras, with the nannies, it's Spanish. Um, and then she even translates for us now. They're very adaptable. And the amount of time that children can spend on learning a language, they pick it up at just this amazing native level with the accent and rolling the R's and everything. Yep. It's just such a cool uh, thing to watch. And I think that yes. children uh, in a another country and learning these languages, I, th I absolutely believe it's a gift. I think it's a gift yeah. that you can give your child. Mm -hmm. Now, a moment ago, we were talking about the government and, you know, what you can kind of expect when you're down in, well, Latin America, but we could say third world countries or developing countries in general. I know some of it's kind of a slanderous term or a de degrading type of term. I actually think it's a term of, of endearment. Like, I am so happy to live in a developing country and yeah. there's no way I would want to live in one of these first world countries, which ends up being absolute nanny states and police states that are watching everything you do. And there's, you know, uh, CCTV on every single street corner and you feel like you're just being spied on. And these these larger governments, Canada, the U.S., Western Europe. They have so much money. They've built up such a war chest from taxation and things like this, and they've put it all into surveillance and militarization of the police force that really like they can butt into anything and everything in your life nonstop. There's more laws than anyone could ever count down in Central America or other places in Latin America. I like I, I affectionately call the governments impotent, and I think that this is a great term you know they just can't get it up they just can't get their shit straight and i'm great with that i'm happy with right. that you know like right. i i live in a, a functional society but government and you know these things just don't play such a part in my life in every single daily situation you know i can just go back to spending time with my family and you know being outdoors enjoying the nice weather drinking some good red wine eating meet and I don't have to be bombarded at all times from these influences. So for me, Latin America is where it's at. I absolutely think that being in a developing country is the way forward for those who are looking for freedom. Now, I agree with everything you just said. At the same time, I'm under no illusions that this will continue to be such uh, throughout eternity. Sure. You know, the same thing with certain cultural things that are common to what you might call developing that, you know, the U S and other Western lands, um, you know, it is beginning to happen here. And I am under the impression that everything you're talking about eventually will happen too. Let me share one thing about the mezcal that I get into. I, I want you to, I've been sharing this little story. I want you to picture that you're driving through uh, the Hills of Kentucky in the United States. And you stop at a gas station and somebody says, you know, there's some guys up in the mountains there selling amazing, you know, uh, white lightning, moonshine. And you you go, oh, I think I'll check that out. You head up there 
and you're tasting, well, this is great. I'd love a great big container of this. Can you sell me a five gallon container? Absolutely. And then you buy it, you put it in your car and you head over to UPS. You say, hey, I'd like to send this back to my house. Okay. And they say, absolutely. Well, that doesn't happen, does it? It does happen here. I go out to these little mescaleros way in the heck out in the country. And I buy a lot of these garafones, these plastic containers. And uh, I have it shipped through a company. Nobody's doing anything wrong. This is not underhanded. It says mezcal on the shipping <laughs> document. Sure, okay? sure. There's no extra charge for that. But I keep telling all my friends who keep saying, oh, it'll always be that way. I don't know. I kind of don't think it will be. And so we'll see. For instance, there was a law passed not many years ago here. I, I guess it was more of a local ordinance that if you were going to have a rental home and rent out to other people, that it was going to be a minimum 10,000 peso per year for whatever. Now I heard it's up to something like 42,000 pesos. So just to give you an idea, 10,000 pesos, about $500. You know, so we're talking about a significant, it's like, what? Politicians will eventually figure out what they have to do to, you know, get the fish that you've been, you know, fishing for over the course of your life. It It is true. And I think that there, you know, when we look at the internet, and we look at the sharing of information and how wonderful it's been for society and and perpetuating good ideas. There are a lot of bad ideas like centralized governments and banking and these types of things where they also have access to massive amounts of information. And these sociopaths are definitely learning from one another. And they're looking, well, look how much power and control that guy's got. Look how what this person's doing. You know, I can do that here in my municipal or state or, you know, regional type of areas. And it, it, politics does attract a certain breed of people, a certain type of people, you know, as an entrepreneur, um, you know, which I am and which you are, you know, we want to have control over our our environment. You know, we want to build something. We want to create something. I truly believe that politicians, what they want to have control over is other people. They, 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 they get off on that type of feeling of being able to boss people around and, and tell people and make decisions for other people. It's, it's a concept that I don't really understand. You know, like I have employees, I'm not telling them how to live their lives. I'm like, all right, here's the tasks, you know, let's make an agreement. You do the tasks and I will give you this amount of money, how they come about it, everything like that, what they, they do at home, what they eat, what they, who they sleep with. I don't care. It's none of my business. You know what I mean? But politicians seem to think that they need to get in there and everything. And I do believe that, you know, we're losing freedom at an alarming rate, definitely in North America and Western Europe, but also in Central America, we're starting to see things slip away. My point is that, you know, don't try to pick a new country and think that it's going to be Shangri-La and that's it. And you're going to get everything all in one shot, everything you ever dreamed of. Because what I have seen over the years is there will be a lot of people who live in like California or New York or Portland or something like this, and they won't move to somewhere else because they're like, well, you know, it ticks nine of the boxes, but this one little thing, right. it gets a big <laughs> red X, you know, and it's yeah. like, but look where you're living. Like, at least this gets you more freedom. So what we need to do is try to get freedom wherever we can. Mm -hmm. And then we need to stack these freedoms, you know, different jurisdiction, right. different laws, have plan Bs, you know, these types of things. And then overall, our life is more free. You know, we can take more responsibility for ourselves. We can, you know, be with our family, but don't look for that Shangri-La. I don't think you're going right. to find that in Mexico. You're not going to find right. it here in Panama. I don't think you're going to find it anywhere. Exactly. And I used to, you know, I used to get interviewed some years ago when I was, uh, moving here and right after I moved here. And I used to say precisely the same thing. You know, you can spend so much time spinning your wheels, trying to find just that perfect spot and, uh, you know, waste a lot of time, you know, being sort of paralyzed by the fear of making a wrong decision. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now talk to me a little bit about San Miguel de Allende. You know, what is sure. it like to, to be there? How is the reception of the, of the local people kind of, right. Daily stuff. What is what is the culture and the people like? Well, to give you an idea about the history of it, there was a guy by the name of Sterling Dickinson, an American who moved here. I think it might have been the late 30s or something. This place became very sort of storied for artists, you know, authors, Jack Kerouac, 
Mm. Neil Cassidy, kind of a sidekick of him, is famous for having died here by falling asleep on on railroad tracks, I believe is what happened, and then getting crushed by a train. Um, but this Sterling Dickinson decided, I'm going to create an art university here. And he did this, I believe, in the late 30s, early 40s. And so what happened is a lot of artistic-minded soldiers returning from World War II took uh, the, their GI Bill and took it down here to this art university in San Miguel. This is what provided the sort of nucleus for the growth of this town. And it became a really thriving artist community. There were different periods of growth. During the 70s, there was a really huge growth spurt. Today, people who have been around here for 30 years or more, uh, they'll tell you it isn't quite the artist spot it used to be, but of course it still is. There's, there's uh, you know, artists, galleries, and museums everywhere. But also, one, one point that a friend of mine made is that there's nobody really alive in San Miguel de Allende right now who can remember a time when this town wasn't full of Mexicans and Americans and Canadians and Europeans. They don't remember a time before that, so it's rather difficult for them uh, you know, to get upset about it. Nobody appears upset. I'm sure there's always going to be somebody who calls me a pinchy gringo or something like that <laughs> under their breath, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, so uh, generally speaking, a lot of people are very happy about the economy here because uh, there's just a, a remarkable number of fantastic restaurants and bars and nightclubs. Centro is... I'd never been to any place like that, probably because I hadn't done as much travel as most. I'd never really been to Europe, um, but beautiful cobblestone streets, narrow. There's this enormous Gothic church in the uh, in the city center that is just lovely, perfectly manicured uh, trees and uh, musicians roving about, you know, looking for tips and stuff like that. So it's really, really, really gorgeous. Now, I, my wife and I built a home outside of the city a bit, but it's still probably about a 15 to 20 minute drive in there, even in medium traffic. So we're still quite close. Um, but yeah, the city is gorgeous. There are some people, it's funny how this happens. There are some people who, okay, there's a guy not long ago who told me, he lives outside of the city and he said, you know, um, I uh, we moved to San Miguel de Allende, you know, 10, 12 years ago, but too many gringos. And I was like, what, what's this? I said, well, you're a gringo and I'm a gringo. We're all right. Right. Said, oh yeah. You and I, we figured it out. We got out. And I went, well, yeah, but so did everyone else who came here. That thing is this funny thing that happens. It seems like I imagine it happens in other expat towns. Um, people are, are posturing, I think, to prove themselves somewhat more uh, a peculiarly uh, Mexican than the next expat or gringo or something like that. And so they say this and they suggest that this place is overrun by gringos. Well, the best estimate I've ever seen is 10 or 12 percent, maybe non-Mexican. Still, when this town gets filled up, as it so often does on weekends, it's not expats. Sure. It's people coming from Mexico City because they hold this town as so dear for its history and being part of where uh, the revolution began to occur. So there's buses all over the place, people driving in from Mexico City in their suburbans, and also Guadalajara, Monterrey, other large cities. So I think that's a bit overplayed. That said, for some of us, it can be rather comfortable to know that there's always somebody who speaks your language around the corner. Sure. And I do think that Okay, I, I am a very much a big fan of learning the local language, history, culture, having local friends. But sometimes being an expat is very tiring, you know, and always conversing in another language can be a lot. So actually just having someone who understands the old, like your own, you know, colloquial type of phrases and, and sure. things like this, or understood the sports or the history from back home, you know, it's kind of like a, a release valve. So, you know, sometimes having other expats around is actually really nice, yes. you know, I, like I don't think it. it should be, well, I mean, it doesn't really matter to me what people do with their life, but in my own right. life, I like to have a mixture of expat yes. friends, you know, and even in yes. that, you know, there will be a, a subset of people who are Canadians who grew up in Southwestern Ontario. And then right. there's, you know, larger group of expats, which are, you know, from Thailand or Norway or, 
Australia or, you know, wherever in Europe, places from all over the world. But then I I, I certainly want to make sure that I have local friends and, and even that different classes and groups of friends, because it gives me right. a, a different type of cultural experience. Now, I, I did want to ask you about the history of San, uh, San Miguel de Allende. Um, and you had said about the art scene. Now, the art scene, is it more like bohemian type of art st style? Is it more like cosmopolitan? Is it more folk? Like when you say art, what do, what do you really mean by that? I mean, both. Okay. Plenty of the bohemian, plenty of the, plenty of the really, you know, high dollar, high ticket price art all over town. Yeah. There is a place that used to be a textile mill more than a hundred years ago that was converted into this sort of mall, I guess you could say, that's just filled with uh, with artists, and uh, you know they do very well there, uh, particularly with the people traveling into town. Um, but still, all throughout Centro, you'll see all of it, and you know you'll see some of the local places with a local artist with a painting hanging in there that you're welcome to buy if you want. You know, so I really think it runs the gamut. Okay, amazing. Because sometimes when you go to places that are are very uh, heavy tourism, a lot of the tourist stuff or art scene stuff, whether you go from this town or the one next to it or a couple of states over is all so similar. And it, right. you know, it's it's a shame because they try to give people what they think that they want, but actually by not being unique, we're having their own creativity and they're just repeating right. someone else's uh, designs. Actually, it makes everything very vanilla and nothing really yeah. stands out. So it's kind of nice you. to hear that in the place that you're at, actually, there is some some really unique things to that area. Also, to your point about the city filling up on the weekends, um, it is a good thing to understand that in a lot of Latin America, when we say it's a tourist hub, that doesn't necessarily mean it's Americans and Canadians. Exactly. It's local tourists who yes. also like to live their life and go out there, you know? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's funny. There are people, There, there is that in line with that thing that I was saying earlier, I didn't know I'd be getting into this, but there's a, a person that I know locally, an older woman, I think she's in her mid seventies. And, you know, somebody had built a sort of a food court in San Miguel de Allende that might be somewhat reminiscent of something you'd see in, in a town in the U.S., of course, it was very Mexican, the design of it. There were a number of people with their different, uh, you know, types of food that they were focusing on. And and you get this, look, oh, it's just, oh, you're just ruining my beautiful Mexico. And I, why would you say that? You know, I, I asked her, have you ever been to the Mercado Roma in Mexico City? Next time you go to Mexico City, go check that place out. You'll be hard pressed to find another gringo in there. There is this idea, there are some people who would like to keep their Mexico as they've idealized it somehow, sure. which is humble and poor and brown. And when you go to Mexico City, you, you're like, wait a minute, there, there's people of all different shades of color, by the way. You know, there are people of all different economic profiles. Yes, I'd like to see more people, uh, you know, do better financially here. Um, but they like what they perceive to be nice things, too, which sometimes isn't far off from what we in the U.S. or Canada or Europe might like. Absolutely. And I think that we've also seen a lot of this with the tastes of cuisines as well, as countries become more economically prosperous, you could say. A lot of them, you know, sometimes want to have more of the Western style cuisine and things like that. But then, you know, a lot of the local cuisine can also be redone with slightly higher quality of, of types of ingredients, you know, but it's, it's, it's this interesting mix of kind of like the old versus the new. And, you know, I sure in Mexico, you've tried some very interesting tacos and, you know, made with pieces of meat that maybe we wouldn't eat in North America, <laughs> you know, um, in our house, we're, we're very accustomed to eating, uh, organ meat and things like that because my wife is from China. So it's, it's very, wow. very common in her type of culture. And so, um, yeah, it's interesting to kind of look at the, as these change because all of this is organic. I mean, it happens naturally as, as time goes on. So you can't have this picture of, you know, a moment in history on, this is the way the, the, the culture should be, the people should be, the food should be. I mean, right. everything is always moving yes. and adapting. 
Yes, and that's true. You know, with regard to food, dining, for instance, I'm probably way more attuned to that than I am art in general. This town could not be accused of somehow gringifying the food. It's international. Mm -hmm. You've got people from Buenos Aires. You've got people from Spain. You've got people from all over with their respective cuisines and their respective fusions of cuisines, often including Mexican cuisine. And there's no shortage of traditional Mexican restaurants either with fantastic food. Yeah, it's neat because when you find a place like that, like there are, um, you know, churches and 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 geo, not geographic, but um, cultural and historical, historical things that will bring people to a place like San, San Miguel de Allende. But it's not just attractive for Americans. Like you said, Argentinians are going right. there and, and other Latinos are coming in. They're bringing in their personal brand of, yeah. of, of Latin America into this place as well. So it really becomes this, um, I, I hate the word melting pot. It seems so, uh, you know, uh, cliche, but I mean, it kind of is, the right term because it's not just the u.s coming in there there's many places that go into building out a country and a culture yes absolutely true there are i know people well i started a about seven years ago i realized i was just sort of sequestered in my studio and i thought you know screw this on fridays i'm going to knock off early and head into centro get together with a friend or two smoke a cigar drink some mezcal you know and I started doing that and it became a thing, Miguel. I did not expect this. I didn't, that was never the plan. But now sometimes we have 35 people come and join us. And we've moved around to various spots. We found a place that accommodates us during this weird time, a little bit out of town. Uh, and we we have, I was thinking about this the other day. I mean, we have, uh, you know, uh, Argentinian, we have people from New Zealand and uh, Australia, Europe. Probably, I'm guessing in that group, it's probably 20 to 25 percent Mexican. You know, it's probably pretty close to 50, 50, maybe 60 percent U.S. Plenty of Canadians coming and going. Yes, and especially in the last couple of years, the Canadians have been pouring into this town even more than usual. So I really enjoy that. I, you know, I, one of my best friends here is uh, originally from India. Um, so, I mean, it, it is melting pot, whatever it is you want to call it. It's a, quite a diverse group of people. And we enjoy getting together every Friday at four o'clock and, and laughing. That's amazing. Let's talk a little bit about the mezcal, because I am very sure. curious about, <laughs> well, just in kind of general, though, actually, interestingly enough, it was just my birthday party last week. And I had a client who came up and brought me a bottle of mezcal. And I probably, okay, besides ordering at a cocktail or something like that at one of the restaurants here in Panama City, I've not sat down and drank mezcal for probably 20 years. I backpacked for right. a couple of months through Mexico and, and drank a lot of mezcal, probably more than I needed to at that time. But, um, you know, maybe some of the listeners are not quite as accustomed to mezcal as, you know, tequila or something. Maybe we can kind of sure. walk through some of the differences sure. and just kind of talk in general about it, because I think it is very interesting. You bet. So the, the word mezcal today and for a long time now has referred to the distillate of any agave plant. So by that definition, tequila is under the umbrella term mezcal. It is a type of mezcal made from the uh, blue Weber or the agave azul um, plant. So it just distinguished itself early. But mezcal is a universe of different plants. You know, some people say 40 or 50. These things are are hybridizing and evolving as we speak. Um, but, you know, it's very, it's not, I could probably sit here and name off 15 of them, different plants, you know, from which you can make mezcal. Some of them you really can't because there aren't enough sugars in them. So, uh, you know, uh, mezcal here up in, well, down in Oaxaca, it really is sort of the Disneyland of mezcal. And the further south you go, the further you find that. Up here in the state of Guanajuato, where I am, it, it really does seem to be more uh, a recent phenomenon because mostly the Mexicans that I knew here, I thought as I began to sell mezcal, I'd have to explain it to gringos and Mexicans would already understand it. No. Okay. Um, I find that a lot of Mexicans... Oh, peligroso, because it was known as the sort of common man's drink. It was not very good. It was very strong, you know. And uh, when you when you get really good stuff, which is made here, but primarily in other states, 
you can't believe how amazing it is. And this is coming from a guy who never really drank liquor. I was a craft brewed beer and a red wine drinker mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for many years. So it took coming to Mexico at the age of, I suppose I was 48 or 49 when I first discovered it. And it blew me away. First of all, I, I used to think of red wine as being the, the most lovely little buzz that you could get. It just made me feel warm and loved, you know, but this stuff, this is an enthusiastic buzz you know <laughs> you just feel so lovely it, it's uh, so easy and makes you want to laugh and enjoy yourself um, so i appreciate that a great deal so there was a young man here who uh, well who was living in oaxaca great story on him i write the mezcal maniac Substack for anybody interested in that um, you can read the story of job and uh, we'll explain how he got me into it and he would take me down to the palenques which was what you call where they make mezcal down in oaxaca and I just struck up relationship with, with these people. And I go down there last year. I went twice. I was just there last month. And sometimes now they go ahead and ship me samples. And they say, do you want any? You know, and I try them out, some friends of mine and I, and we'll buy some garrafones of what they have if we think we like it, you know. And uh, so I just thought, you know, in the beginning, I'm not going to get serious about this. I'm not going to, don't, don't get me started on getting legal and all of the hoops and the people I got to deal with there. So I just called my my little marca, my brand, if you will, Guinho Guinho, which means wink, wink. The idea was that it was just among friends. You know, I mostly drink and share it with friends, but there are some people who want to buy it. So I pass this along. I make a little bit of money on it, but not to any degree that would cause any, uh, I think, consternation or irritation from anyone. Anyway, that's never come up. Mm -hmm. So do you take, do you work with the same farms or fincas or 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 areas every time and then they have kind of like the 2022 mezcal harvest product and then you know it, it's different from the year previous and like maybe walk me through this piece of it a little sure, bit sure because there are some people like that uh there's mohen short for hermogenes who's out in lagoche in the miohotlan valley in oaxaca he's pretty remote about two and a half hours away from the city there's a placido hernandez these guys just consistently make amazing stuff. One of the neat things about it, when you really get into it, when you become a mezcal maniac like me and some of my friends, <laughs> is you you start to realize you're not really looking for it to be standardized. Sure. You know, the rum or the vodka or the gin is always... I understand why it is that way, but I can't wait next year to try Mohen's Madre Quiche, which is the name of an agave and thus a type of mezcal that is made. It's just so earthy and remarkable, and they do vary from year to year. And we look forward to to trying the new stuff. Uh, Placido Hernandez in his uh, his Tepestate, it's just fantastic every time he makes it, but a little bit different, you know. So uh, I do have some people like that, but I'm always on the lookout for other maestros, mezcaleros. And uh, now they message me. There was a girl in in, uh, in Guerrero there near Acapulco who just started messaging me a couple of years ago. We have mezcal, we have mezcal. And I'm like, I'm busy right now. But she kept pushing, free shipping, free shipping. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, let me look at what you got. So she sent me three samples. And there was one I wasn't familiar with made out of an agave that's endemic to that region called Sakatoro. Sounds Japanese, is not. Um, and I love this stuff. They make this amazing Sakatoro. So, you know, this happens. People get me on Facebook because they find out that I buy mezcal. And so they're always wanting to send samples, which is very nice. And uh, there's just, there is some limit. I mean, I brought back 200 liters last month. So I'm telling them now, look, I appreciate that. Maybe give me a little bit of time, but I've got to get this stuff in bottles now, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so do you re-bottle it and brand it and everything like that? Or is it just, it's very like, uh, I don't know, plain Jane type of thing. What does it look like well, at the, after well, you've done it's pretty plain piece? Jane. I'll send you the Guinho Guinho label, which I had made on Fiverr by a, a, a an artist in Pakistan years ago, you know. <laughs> Very <But> authentic. I, <laughs> <laughs> and you just said you were in the art capital of Mexico. My goodness. Right. I don't, look, I went on Fiverr. Um, but uh, <laughs> so there was a little, there's also a sticker I put underneath that which has got all the information. I want to make it clear. I'm not trying to pretend. Every now and then somebody will ask me, so you made this? And I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would surely screw it up. These guys, many of them, five, six generations, they've wow. been learning a little bit every generation about how to make it better, you know? So I make sure the name, the name of the area where they're in, 
what uh, month and year they made it, what month and year I bottled it, all of that type of information is on there so that they, of course, are getting full credit for this, should anyone care. Amazing. Now, how do you like to drink mezcal? Neat, Miguel. Okay. Definitely neat. Now, it's a joke between my friends and I. Some people think that they're ticking me off a lot when in my presence they'll drop an ice cube <laughs> or they'll, they'll mix it with some soda or something like that. I don't really care, like okay. you. I want people to do what they want to do, but it can be a little bit of fun for me to just shake my head and say, oh, <laughs> oh okay, when will you learn? You know. Um, but yeah, definitely I like it neat. Although it is true, if you're going to have a cocktail, if you're going to make a margarita, and you're going to put kind of a cheap sort of flavorless mezcal in it, it will be better if you put a really nice full flavored earthy mezcal in it. I know mm -hmm. that. So it's a train moving through town. More and more people are making uh, mezcal cocktails and more power to them. And it's just a, you treat it like a sipping type of spirit. Oh, yeah. yeah, perfect. Oh, yeah, for sure. And, you know, sipping is the main thing. You know, most distillates I think you'll find are in the vicinity of 38 to 42 percent. Most of these are in the high 40s. Okay. So it can be anywhere from 45, but I've got some stuff that's in the high 50s and above. So the, the thing that they've always said here in Mexico is that you need to take it with besitos, little kisses. And it really is true. Some people can have a difficult time sort of adjusting their flow rate in the beginning because they're used to drinking a 38% vodka or something. And this stuff's stronger. And, and they think it's overwhelming, but it's because they're taking too big a sip. I can have approximately a 20 or a two ounce or 50 milliliter, uh, you know, shot glass and nurse that for an hour, hour and a half. Okay. Just little molecules at a time. And it's just so beautiful. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for sharing this because I think it actually is so interesting because, you know, you've left the U S you've come down to Mexico, you know, you have your career, but then on the side, you start this and yeah. you know, this is, it sounds Okay, it's a small business, but it also sounds like a hobby and it also sounds like yes. a passion the way it that is. you describe it. Yeah. So it's yes. kind of cool because think if you were still up in Michigan, I mean, this never would have happened. You would have never found this love affair with Mezcal, right. which really spoke right. to you. So think about the opportunities, you know, for mm -hmm. our listeners right now, if you guys are listening to this, there's just opportunities that you just have no idea about when you move overseas and something might really just interest you um like your mezcal story i mean that's amazing right. jonathan i love it i think that's so awesome well thank you you know by the way we've got a little documentary coming out local friend of mine alex who was uh, born in mexico to german parents but lived in uh you know new york city most of his life but has been living here for some time i think he's about 44 45 now he asked me a year and a half or so ago he's like uh will you take me to oaxaca I'm like, yeah, man, we'll do this. He says, maybe we can make a little five, 10 minute, you know, documentary. Well, it looks like it's going to be 50 minutes. Wow. But there comes a time in this documentary, we're out in the palenques and I'm sipping the whole time. And really a significant share of it is just close-ups of me going, oh, that's good. <laughs> oh, wow. You know, I wish we could have gotten a microphone to the maestros, you know, that might've made it a little bit better. So I'll remember that. But the other thing is I say at one point, while I'm a little tipsy, I handle myself pretty well when I've been drinking for a while. But still, I say, this is weird. I said, but how could it be that I could say something like mezcal changed my life? A liquor? A spirit changed my life? It seems strange, but it does seem to have. It has given me a, a sort of a passion for something I never imagined getting passionate about. It's given me an opportunity to learn not only about this, this spirit, but also about the people who make it and about the various ways they do it and why they do it. It's introduced me a little bit to the Zapotec language. It's very common in, uh, you know, in, in uh, Oaxaca, a lot of the people who make it are from the Zapotec tribe. And so, uh, you know, you learn a little things about that and that culture and everything, you know. So it's just, I consider it a blessing. I can't really explain why, but it just has been. Amazing. I love it. Jonathan, what a fantastic conversation. Thank you for sharing about your experiences growing up and your move down to Mexico and what your life is like in Mexico and, and just Mexico and San Miguel de Allende in, in general. And then just of your stories about how you found Mezcal and, and obviously a, a deep passion for the art and the, the, the work and the craftsmanship that goes into this. So thank you so much for your time. You're if welcome. My, Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Now, 
if my listeners want to get a hold of you, if maybe they want to follow sure. you on sub Substack or kind of learn more about your what you're doing with the mezcal, where can we send them? Well, you can certainly go to my voiceover website. That is where I, that's my actual career. It's just jonathanlockwood.com. And you can listen to my voice demos there. If you hire people to do voiceovers, hire me. Uh, and yes, the, I write this sub stack called Mescal Maniac. If that holds any interest for you, check that out. You can also just, uh, you know, friend me on Facebook. I know I probably shouldn't be on there, but I am. <laughs> Amazing. Jonathan, thank you so much for your time. And I will talk to you soon. All right. Thank you, Miguel.